Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. Um, we're here today. Thank goodness. Um, a lot of uh, heavy stuff going on weather wise and with the um, hurricane and people. We had a good prayer session this morning, praying for the people, the first responders people that can be, you know, getting to the people that are still out there. Um, we just thank you, Father, for, for sending those people out there um, and getting to the right place at the right time, that there isn't any more suffering for these, these folks. Um, heavy stuff, heavy stuff. But today we are going into part two of the Nehemiah No you were here last week or if you saw the message last week we talked about what the Nehemiah know or what type of know Nehemiah actually utilized in his in the story of rebuilding of the wall um, in the recap of part one we had we explored the, the lesson that came from seemingly simple exchange between Jesus and the Canaanite woman. And I think I went over, you know, that, what I saw. And the, the basic story revealed to, to, that I tried to, to come across with was that um, as believers and as the church that we've been comfortable too long with the scraps under the table. And that it's time that God is inviting us to that table, that communion. Um, and it reminds me of when we when we do our decrees in the in the mornings about the great communion revival. He's calling us to that table even now, right? That communion with him. Um, I explained a little bit about Psalm twenty three and how he you know he prepared the table even in the middle of our enemies and the fears and the distractions and the weather and and different things that are happening with folks. Um, and, and different um, not so wonderful things that are happening in the politics and ministries around and, and things like that that are happening right now. Um, it's not necessarily that they're distractions, but they can be, and we don't want to let them be, right? We want to hear what God is saying. We want to be able to crawl up onto his shoulder and see it from his perspective. Amen? Amen. And through that lens, we understand that God is calling us higher, away from the distractions, the fears, even the comforts that we've learned to be content with in some cases. We've learned that communion is not just a ritual, but a strategy session with God where we can receive his wisdom, his perspective, and his peace to navigate the battles that we currently face. Then we, dove, we drove into the Nehemiah No. And we talked about distractions and, and Nehemiah's unwavering focus amidst those distractions and his ability to discern between God's voice and the voices of the world, the flesh, the devil. And that taught us that not every opportunity is an invitation from God. Discernment is the foundation for saying the right no, the correct no, that we must rely on God to reveal which paths to take, just as Nehemiah did. As we continue today in part two, let's keep that image of the table in mind. God is calling us to a deeper communion with him where we gain his blueprint, his strategies for building, rebuilding, and fortifying for the coming days. Today we'll explore how to stay focused and resist distractions, how to say, oh no, I'm not coming down from the great work that he has set in our hearts. Amen. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins, will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repairer of broken walls, 
the restorer of streets with dwellings, Isaiah 58, 12. And I had mentioned that last week, that that was um, the scripture that was given to our class in Bible school when I, for our graduating class. We all got one particular verse, and that was, that was supposed to be how we were represented, how, how, how God was supposed to show up in our lives as a class. And I thought that was really awesome. While Nehemiah's great work was an actual physical task, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, our great work necess may not necessarily be a physical task, but it's definitely maturing the inner man, the real us, the real you, a spiritual work that's becoming more like Christ every day. Every believer is called to mature in faith, grow in love, and become a living reflection of Jesus to the world. Amen. That's our rebuilding. That's our building and rebuilding. Just as Nehemiah saw through the deceptive offer to meet at Ono, we must also recognize the Ono in our lives. Amen? You know what I mean? Maybe you're not rebuilding walls like Nehemiah, but you are building something much more important, a life that reflects Christ a heart that increases in love and faith that matures daily. This is your great work, becoming the person God designed you to be, fortifying you and preparing you for the work of the kingdom and his expansion. I wanted to, to I, I mentioned the oh no aspect of it because there was a, a good portion of it that I, I kind of leapt through on the last message. Um, in Nehemiah 6, and I'll tell you what Ono is, <clears throat> if you remember from last week's, in Nehemiah 6, verse 2, Sanballat, Geshem, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message that says, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. He used discernment. He understood. He had wisdom as that they were trying to trick him. In this verse, Nehemiah is being invited by his enemies, of course, to the plain of Ono, under the pretense of a peaceful meeting, but their true intent was to harm and distract him from the great work that, of the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. Nehemiah discerned their intentions and refused to be diverted. And he responded famously, I am doing a great work, I cannot come down. Sorry, buddies. The plains of Ono might seem just like a small mention in the book of Nehemiah, but there are actually some interesting facts. The plain of Ono was located in the Valley of Ono, in an area near modern-day city of Lod, or Lida, in Israel. This location was on the border between Judea and Samaria, about 25 to 30 minutes northwest of Jerusalem. It was strategically positioned near a crossroads. It was an important trade route, which made it accessible, a very accessible meeting place, but also potentially dangerous due to its location uh, to the periphery territories. It was a neutral ground, but a risky one. One, or Ono, was considered an, a neutral or border area, which is why Sanballat and Geshem invited Nehemiah there to meet. You know, meet. They really wanted to strangle him, probably. However, its, its neutrality was precisely what made it dangerous. Being far from the safety of Jerusalem, it was a perfect place for an ambush or a trickery of any kind. By choosing the plains of Ono, Nehemiah's enemies were trying to lure him away from his home base to a potentially compromising position. It was a historical alliance hub. The choice of the plain of Ono was, as a meeting place was not random. It's believed that the leaders who invited Nehemiah um, represented a coalition of local powers that opposed the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Ono was near the territory of these adversaries that asked him to come meet, making it a convenient place for them to plot against Nehemiah while appearing to offer friendly negotiation. <laughs> What's interesting about the plain of Ono as it's a periphery, uh, it's on the outskirts, it's um, a border. I can't even explain it even more than the fact that my final thinking in that is the periphery is always a dangerous place to be. Spiritually, 
especially. Stragglers. You remember the stragglers in the story of the Amalekites? The Amalekites liked to just, they took off the stragglers, the people that were on the periphery, the ones that couldn't keep up, the ones that were falling behind. They, they would always come back around and take them out first. I see that as Christians that push the envelope, so to speak. How much flesh can I hold on to, you know, and still be saved? Those nominal Christians, easily picked off. Easily picked off. Bad place to be, the periphery. <laughs> we need to make sure that we see those oh no situations in our lives. Oh no, spelled O N O. I mean, we need, oh no. <laughs> right? I mean, seriously, it's one of those things. I, I chose to look at that because it's a, it was a distraction and it's, it's to like a gray area. It's a distraction to a gray area and, and a periphery area where lots of things can happen bad if you're not set straight in your, in your heart and mind with God, right? Um, and that you know that you know that you were sent to that particular type of place or to go into that particular direction, right? You have to have God's backing. Examples of, of some distractions. Now, these, these may be for you, the Plains of Ono. Uh, maybe it's the first thing you wake up is your phone. You have to check your phone. Scroll through all your emails or whatever it is. What if it's a social invitation that can compromise your values? Well, I just have to go to that. And I know it's not going to be favorable. There's, there's a lot of things there that go on that I'm you know, susceptible to. Uh, that I don't want to see or whatever. Saying no will actually protect your integrity and keep you focused on the, your spiritual walk. What if it's a pressure to conform to worldly success even? Saying no to choosing and choosing instead to live within your means. What if it's something that you, I just have to have that car. I just have to, you know, my neighbor has this and I really want to look like I'm making it well, you know, doing really good in life. So I got to go out of my way to, you know, take out loans and things where I couldn't, I couldn't afford it. So we live according to our means. We say no. What if it's overcommitting? What if it's overcommitting to work? What if it's overcommitting to people? These are, these are really, they're, they're distractions that need to be leveled out with your relationship and with God. He needs to tell you what you can buy, what you could, you know, how you can live your life, right? What if it's a toxic relationship that's draining you? You realize that this relationship is harming your spiritual life and decide to establish healthy boundaries. That's what happens, right? You want to establish healthy boundaries. That's how you say no. What if it's just digital distractions? You realize that these distractions are robbing you of your time, of your energy, emotional energy. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to, to show you these things. Whatever your plane of Ono is in your life, <laughs> we all have them. And we're all susceptible to distraction, especially right now. There's so many things that can be distracting and misleading and time-consuming. What if you're compromising integrity for convenience? You're presented with an option that would make your life easier, you know, a little white lie or something that you could do at work to skip steps. It might seem harmless, but you know in inside that it goes against your integrity or God's standards. Oh no. You feel the conviction, you stay true to your values, and even more, even if it's difficult, you say no. Choosing the harder but righteous path, trusting that God will honor your decision, and he will. So the next time you're tempted to stray from your purpose, your peace, remember the plains of Ono and let your spirit shout, oh no, God's doing a great work in me and I cannot come down. <laughs>
The Nehemiah no is a daily choice. Saying no like Nehemiah is about making a daily choice that prioritizes spiritual maturity in the eternal perspective over temporary distractions. It's about recognizing that every no to distractions is really a yes to growing closer to God. Amen? Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Growth. Philippians 3.13, Paul's focus on pressing toward the goal of spiritual maturity, forgetting all those things that lie behind, even the, even the good stuff, that you, all the awards that you won. <laughs> of course, nowadays you can win anything just for showing up. Poor kids. Nehemiah knew his calling was what? To finish the wall, to build a strong spiritual life, to, to re-engage the people in their spiritual walk with God, right? And to say no that anything hindered that. Think about what spiritual growth like looks like in your life. Is it developing a deeper prayer life? Is it studying more scripture? Is it overcoming a particular sin or growing in the fruit of patience, love? Self-control. I have a self-control issue with cookies. You all could, you know, help me, join me in pr with me in prayer. <laughs> if I see it, I eat it. It's, it's I, I, I'm just not there yet. I'm not there yet. Oh, no. I got to remember. Oh, no. What are the planes of Ono in your spiritual life? those areas that you find yourself distracted from you know, growing closer to God, what can you start saying no to this week to prioritize your spiritual maturity? <coughs> that was the end of part two. It's actually part of, I mean, the end of part one. The last part is what I really wanted to talk about today. I was excited about. This is called rebuilding and testimony. Philippians 2.13, again, actually, we hear this all the time. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases him. For it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to perform, to will and to do for his good pleasure. And that, and it, I don't, I don't, it's like, in a nutshell, it's like when you say, oh, God, uh, by the time I'm done with this message, I can't go. I might go back and I'm going to look at all these, these, these different strategies that 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 Jason put out there. And it, you know what? It's like ten or twelve messages I got to listen to. That's twelve hours worth of material. My brain is going to explode. No, it is God who is at work giving you the power to be able to do and to be. The willingness will come with it. And the thing is, is it's not all of that. It, you'll see. But but he has he has laid out a, a particular strategy in the last month and a half or two that uh, we're going to share. What happens when we do our part to yield to his spiritual growth? Well, he become you know he begins the process of rebuilding us, right? Holiness happens inadvertently even. <laughs> But when you're yielding to him, that's all that can happen. The new creation you. And it's for his pleasure. It's his pleasure to make a testimony of a, a living testament to the power and love of his son, Jesus. Revelations 12, 11 says, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. It's interesting when I I was looking at um, John five verse one through fifteen, and, it, and 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 in that is the story 
where Jesus travels to Jerusalem for a Jewish festival. And he goes to the pool of Bethesda. Um, and Bethesda means house of mercy, which I always thought was really neat. But it was the pool of Bethesda where the waters were stirred, possibly by the, you know, by the angel. Um, and then the first person to jump in the waters was healed, uh, like immediately. At least that was the belief at the time. And we had, when, when Jesus got there, he, he saw there was, a, there was a, just a ton of people waiting with their eyes completely fixed on the water, waiting for it to start bubbling up and, and, and moving, right? Because the first one, it's only the first one that, that made it in while it was doing that, was the one that was healed. And so he came across somebody that couldn't get in there too quickly. He was an invalid. He was 38 years in, you know, unable to get up and run into the pool. And so out of all of those people that were fixed, he gained the glance of somebody that was on his mat who had been that way for 38 years. And he says, do you want to be healed? And I'm thinking, when you look back and, and you see in the, in the beggars of that time, even, even currently some people that stand on the street corners can make a pretty good amount of money. At that time, that's what they did. He wanted to make sure that there was actually in him part of him saying, I've been this way for 38 years. I'm alive. I got food. You know, apparently things are okay. Do you really want to be healed? You've been that way for so long. You've been under the table with scraps for so long. Do you really want to be healed? Do you want to come to the table? And the man said, I, I, I can't unless somebody else helps me. Because I am the way that I am. I, I, so I need some help. I'll never make it there. He said, Jesus didn't even reply to his, that answer. He just said, get up, take up your mat, and walk. And the man, <clears throat> the man was immediately healed. He picked up his mat and walked away. Those people around him had a focus problem. You know, we have the focus challenge, right? Focus strategy, I should say. They had a focus problem. Not one of them knew that even Jesus was there and that he, he was able to heal anybody. At that, everybody was so focused on the water and they're, and they're, you know, that was it. That was what's going to happen. When this man actually looked up at Jesus and said, Hey, I'm like this, I need help. They had a focus problem. Why do you think he told him to pick up his mat? I didn't just leave his bed there. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, you know, some of the religious leaders at the time saw it and said, hey, you can't do that on the Sabbath because it happened on the Sabbath. You can't carry your stuff with you. That's a no-no, right? It wanted, they want, he specifically with intention wanted to stir up some of their, not their waters, but you know, they wanted to stir them up. But, but more importantly in this message is what I was, when I was looking at it was, if he walked through the village going towards the temple, went to the temple or whatever, and people saw him and they, without his mat, you know how much red, more readily available they were to recognize who he was? To recognize a re miracle happen? If he had his mat with him, his bed? Otherwise, they could have been like, who's that guy? I've never seen him before. What's he doing walking around? What's he going, you know, why, you know? It was his testimony. That was his ministry. His testimony, he curled up underneath his arm. That's why he took up his mat. Something happened to me in the 38-year period of my life. I wasn't paralyzed for 38 years like this guy was. 
but about 38 years, I ventured to South Carolina. <laughs> I keep forgetting because I was in such bad shape when I got here that I had my two 40-year-old birthdays because they thought I was 39. So I saved the candles for the following year. <laughs> That's how bad a shape I was. But when I was 38, I came. And a lot of, of course, I was, I was born again when I was five. But you know, a lot of life happened between five and 38. A lot of choices, of bad choices that I had to, to pay for. And, um, but God got a hold of me in my 38th year. And he gave me this scripture. And I, I know you've heard it, but I, I have to say it again. <laughs> It's 2 Samuel 22, 21 through 25 in the message. It says, God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I cleaned up my act, he gave me a fresh start. Indeed, I've kept alert to God's ways and I haven't taken God for granted. Every day, every day I review his ways and his works. I try not to miss a trick. I feel put back together and I'm watching my step now. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. That scripture in and of itself is the 60-day challenge in a nutshell. That is opening your heart to his examination and dealing with the hurt and the trauma and all the different things that happen. And, and so it's so... It's so um, it really just explained and put, paint a picture of me. So I had to put it, we put it on our, some of the material. <laughs> this passage from 2 Samuel is part of David's song of praise that mirrors Psalm 18, where he thanks God for delivering him from his enemies and acknowledges how God fortified, restored, rebuilt, and guided him with, strategically by his ways. David fully surrendered. This is how he wants to work in all of us. All of us. We need rebuilding on the inside, the temple first, so that we can hear his divine strategies for the fortification of the walls and the expansion of the kingdom. Amen. He brought his peace into my heart and life. Peace in Hebrew is shalom. The peace of God in Greek is Irene, or Irene in English. And that word comes from the verb iro, which means to join or to bind together that which had been separated. It implies a sense of wholeness and completeness. God made my life complete when I laid all the pieces before him. He brought me peace. Amen. Now, rebuilding Jason didn't happen overnight. I'm <laughs> sorry. There were times when distractions came, much like the sand ballot and Tobiah and Nehemiah's story. But, but, but most of that was at the in the in the beginning, you know, stages of 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 really developing a prayer, you know, connection with the Lord and and, and getting cleaned up. Now it's mostly like maintenance and periodically God gives me something really great to work on. But God gave me the discernment to stay focused at the time and to continue on in his strength, to continue building when it was hard. I, re <clears throat> I realized that rebuilding wasn't just about fixing how things looked on the outside, but they were the battles that I had to fight on my inside you know, in order to be an expression after. Today, the walls that once seemed broken beyond repair have been rebuilt by God's grace. My thoughts are aligned with his truth. My relationships have been restored. My confidence in God's purpose for my life has been renewed. The rebuilding process wasn't necessarily easy, and I'm continuing in it, right? We're all being continuing in that walk. But looking back, it was a lot easier than I imagined. I mean, how many people 
have you shared, you know, dropping down into your spirit and receiving forgiveness? And it's easier than you think. And then looking back, it was like, wow, that was a tough time. But it could have been, I mean, it was so much easier than I thought it would be. 38 years, of those 38 years, I was in sin probably a dozen, maybe 12 years. Really, you know, dark, a dark place. 12 years out the door in like a month from praying things, to allowing God to do my, the searching. That's incredibly quick. I don't know. I mean, some people don't come out of, you know, a decade of, of evil just like that. So I, I praise God and thank thank him for, for the work that he's done in my life. Um, and he can do, and everybody listening to this message, he can do that to, for you guys too. And he has for some already. Whether it's your, your thought life or your relationships, your spiritual life, the, it all begins with emotions. It all begins with the you know free process of real, true forgiveness. And, and it's not nearly as hard as you think it might be. When I was praying in, in my prayer time a couple of weeks back when I was at prep, you know, preparing for the Nehemiah message, I was inquiring of, of God uh, for blueprints and strategies and, and things for the coming anticipation of coming stuff politically, um, the things that are going on with the church as a, as a whole, and seeing a lot of, a lot of you know, big names have, have fallen, um, you know, the past so many years. And, and it's just heart-wrenching to see. And, you know, one of the first things that, um, on, on the way that Nehemiah dealt with things was he, he first had a burden for the people. And there's no great awakening. There's no, nothing huge like that has ever started without a burden for God's people first. And wow, there's there's such a burden for lots of people at this point. I mean, there's burden for people that got hit by the hurricane this past week, and there's burdens for you know all of that. That mess is is so heavy, um, and and can weigh on us so much. Um, we have to have a strategy in order to seek God and ask if there's if there's any way that we can plug in. If there's anything that we can do, let us know you know, in our hearts, instead of going out of our way, uh, out of our, you know, even our ability, you know, in some cases, beyond our even our, our ability to, to help where we shouldn't be putting our nose in, you know, other people's businesses and what, what have you. Um, but God will be faithful and give us direction. If, he, if we are able to help, he will, he will surely say, you go. And we will listen. But we have to have that relationship. And we have to understand the things that are, you know, in our hearts that are that can be triggered by, by, by justice, by mercy, by all of those things that are, you know, motivational giftings in us aren't necessarily God motivations. Those are just things that we like, how we like to show up in life. God uses those when they're submitted to him. So we just got to make sure that we follow some strategies. And God said, you already got these strategies. And I was like, what do you mean you got these strategies? He said, we got these. We gave, we've been giving, I've been giving you these strategies for a long time now. You call them challenges. And I was like, oh. I like when God's just, you know, point blank like that when, in my prayer time. And I still didn't have a clue exactly what he, how he was tying that together with, with strategy. But this was, this was before a lot of things started happening. This was before the, the hurricane. This was before the things, you know, other stuff was happening in the news. Um, I don't even, I, don't, I haven't watched the, the, the real news since like 2016 myself. So I don't really know what's going on half the time unless my, unless my wife or somebody tells me. <laughs> Um, I don't necessarily recommend that for you guys, but I felt like that's what God wanted me to do. 
So I keep myself somewhat distant just so that I can hear God clearly. So he says, yeah, you call these challenges. And now we started with the year with the, the emotional healing challenge, which is the 60-day challenge that we, we talk about all the time. We started that as a, as a church. And, and of course, that's something that we need to utilize in our lives as a, on a daily basis, on a, 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 you know, even becoming in a practical way of living is, you know, when somebody out, pulls out in front of you, we have to learn how to get that fear under control, you know, receive forgiveness for taking it in and then getting your peace back. I mean, that's like a daily thing that we just need releasing forgiveness and demands and expectations on our kids or our spouses, um, you know, in-laws or what have you prior to the, you know, all of those things are part of the 60 day challenge that we, you learn how to pray. And that can be taken throughout the entire, um, throughout this entire list of challenges that we have. Right. In fact, the, the, the peace challenge is, you know, pivotal in that. But we had after, after that particular one at the beginning of the year, what I wanted to focus on mainly was, we started with the peace challenge just a few months ago. And the peace challenge, you know, if you guys remember, it, it, it helps you maintain inner peace regardless of, you know, external circumstances. Well, we have lots of external circumstances. You could pick any one of them, and they could, they could make you lose your peace if you focused on too long. But that was the challenge, right? The strategy is to maintain that. The strategy is... This is, if you are losing your peace, then you go to the peace challenge. You go to the 60-day challenge. You get your peace back. Create a space for spiritual rest to avoid burnout. To use peace as a weapon, even, against fear and, and, and confusion. Ground yourself in God's promises to sustain, sustain in your peace, even, amidst the trials. What is His promises? And His promises and His things that he's, he's done in the past can get your peace back. Why would God fail me now? He's showed up every single time. He showed up like this. He showed up like that. He, you know, remind yourself. Think about those things. Your peace comes back. Dismantling the house of thought. We had, we had a couple messages. I think it was two messages on the, the house of thought. These are things that we are going to need. See, this is, this is what, what he told me, that the strategies um, in these particular messages in the last couple months are, are, they call them specifically strategies because they're not, it's because it's serious. It, they're, they're not just, you know, how, you know how Nehemiah, it was serious. When Nehemiah was building the walls, they had a sword in one side while they were the trow and it was a sword in one hand and the trow in the other, right? It was because it was serious times. It's serious times right now. We have to learn how to war and build and keep building the same way that he did. These are the strategies to do that. Peace is not just, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm safe, right? We learned that it is actually offensive. It's an, an offensive tactic that we could use against the enemy. The God of peace shall cross him under his heel, right? Then we, then we went right, th right to the house of thought, which is trying, you know, it's, it's dismantling mental strongholds that are rooted in fear, doubt, unworthiness, replacing the negative thought patterns with the truth of Scripture that God re reveals to you by his Holy Spirit. Understanding that the mind is a battleground in spiritual warfare as well. We have what two doors, right? We have the mind and the will, and we have the mind and the emotion doors. Yeah, lots of things happen in the mind. They can get carried away at any moment. The house of thought. Embrace transformation by the renewing of the mind. The way that we teach. Build a strong spiritual foundation by rooting out lies before rebuilding with his truth.
No, we went from the 60 day peace challenge to talking about our thinking and the lies that are possibly rooting in there, living as roots in us. Then I brought the, the unmasking the lies where I was able to share about part of my identity that I believed was a lie was, you know, hey, I'm not allowed to be happy. That was summed up in a nutshell, right? I'm not allowed to be happy. If you're happy, you're going to miss out. It's going to be taken from you. Or when it crashes, you're going to feel a lot of pain. It was a lie. We learned to expose the lies. Lord, Lord, search us in our prayer time for anything that we believe, that is subtle even, that we believe about ourselves that is not you. We unmask those lies with God's and find joy in God's truth and being able to, for me, it was being able to enjoy things that I didn't know I was allowed to enjoy. I, I, I would dismiss it like that would be too fun. Can't have too much fun. You know, um, but he could do that for all of us. This is part of the, this is part of the, the way that God wants us to work right now. That joy and that you know um, being able to enjoy things led into the, what we, what we called how to enjoy God in part one and two. These these are all going to be in a list under, underneath the uh, the video that we put up. The joy challenge. How to enjoy God? That's what we I called it the joy challenge. We prioritize intimacy with God over religious tasks. Even we delight in God's presence to find strength and direction. The joy of the Lord is our strength, right? We delight in His presence. We do it every Tuesday. If you don't do it at home, do it at home. Bring it with you. Align your desires with God's heart through personal devotion. Understand that enjoying God leads to sustained spiritual strength. Enjoying Him. There's not very many people that I've come across that actually say, I enjoy God. But you know, it's something that we have to, it, I, we, we're supposed to do it. It's biblical. You're supposed to enjoy God. Recognize that everything flows from a relationship with Him. And not just not just service to him. <clears throat> Continue to cultivate intimacy with God as the primary goal. Allow your joy in God to overflow into every aspect of life. Enjoy God's presence daily, not just during quiet moments. Recognize that God's delight in you fuels your delight in Him. Isn't that neat? That's Zephaniah 3.17. He rejoices over us with dancing and singing. Let that be the fuel. Think about that when you're, when you're trying to feel joyful about God, right? He's joyful over me. And live a life of spiritual satisfaction that's rooted in your relationship with God. Where you went after that joy challenge and how to enjoy part uh, God part two, we went into keeping the main thing the main thing. How to keep God's kingdom the focus of all of our efforts in life. Ensure your work is motivated by love, worship, and obedience. Recognize that the work is ultimately for God's glory and not personal achievement. Align all your goals and actions with the advancement of God's kingdom in his love. But even keeping the main thing the main thing, we then, you see the pattern, the way that things worked. Was, which was, it was so neat, and it had to be God, that it was like, keep the main thing the main thing. Your, your, your kingdom should be your main focus. Keeping Jesus central, kingdom-minded, goes right into the focus challenge, because that was the next one that we did. And that was what? Resist, resist, 
the distractions that pull you away from God and his mission and pull you out of his protection, right? Pull you out of his abiding. Stay persistent and focused in completing the work, even in the face of opposition. Maintain single-minded, not double-mindedness. Single-minded focus on God's assignment. Prioritize spiritual goals over external pressure. What does God see about what's happening out here? Learn to say no to distractions and yes to God's direction. Keep your eyes fixed on the end goal, finishing God's work that he's asked. You will build spiritual ability to persist in the face of opposition as you practice. The focus challenge then went into discernment. I know we talked a little bit about this last week about the discernment challenge, but the discernment challenge was, was basically developing spiritual discernment to recognize God's voice. To, be, <clears throat> to discern between distractions and what God's assignments are. To learn to navigate false opportunities even and stay aligned with God's will. Opportunities arise, but they aren't all God. It's always good to go back and say, hey, I just got this offer, and it looks great on paper. What do you think about it, God? And if he has his piece on it, go with it. If he doesn't, then don't. Right? That's discernment. Avoiding unnecessary battles by walking in wisdom in God's timing. We use discernment to identify spiritual traps, possibly, that the enemy might try to deceive us with. The discernment challenge then led into the Nehemiah No and Nehemiah strategy. Nehemiah's strategy was what? First, there was, always, there was a burden for God's people. There was a burden for the people. Rebuilding always starts with a burden for others. A scene from Nehemiah <clears throat> to the leaders that, like, you know, John Wesley, Billy Graham, I mentioned them. He had prayerful dependence. He sought God through prayer and fasting before ever acting on anything. And he relied on divine wisdom for guidance and strength, just like David did before he went into battle. He had strategic planning. He carefully assessed the situation and developed a detailed plan for rebuilding, staying focused in anticipating challenges. That's where we're at in our rebuilding process. Resisting distractions. Despite opposition, Nehemiah remained steadfast, refusing to distract, to be distracted, famously declaring, I'm doing your great work, I can't come down. We need to do that too. He empowered a people. He united the people. He delegated tasks. He fostered collective, that fostered collective effort. He ensured that everyone had a role in success of the building of the wall. And then, of course, the completion with gratitude when it was, and it, the wall was dedicated after it was completed and celebrated with gratitude and renewed spiritual focus on God and his ability to accomplish such a huge task with these people in just 52 days. I guess what I want to I, I want to ask, or to have you be able to do, would be we don't need to go back and look at if we're living, you know, parts of all of those messages already in our lives. We want to really look at the red flags for where we're at, and and so I would I would say, Lord, if I'm struggling with peace, let's let's go back to the sixty day challenge, you know and find peace. Let's go back to the peace challenge if you want to grow that muscle. Because right now might be one of the easiest times that we're living in com compared to what it could be coming. We don't know. But this is a strategy that God's laid out. So we must need it desperately. I mean, we did need it. We, we Everybody needs these things um, it, to live the way that he wants us to live. But 
specifically right now. I don't know why God would want it. You know, these are strategies. We got to do these things. God will do it with us if we yield to him. He will empower us to break through. But the questions that I ask in order to see what level we're on would be something like, you know, what are the situations or relationships that are disrupting your inner peace? What are, what are, if, is there any relationships or is there situations right now in your life that are pulling you away from that? Then you'd go to the peace challenge. Or what practices or habits can I introduce to ensure that my joy in God remains central, even if I'm busy, busy with work, busy with people? What are the barriers that prevent me from fully delighting in God's presence? And how can I get rid of them? These are the things that you want to take to your prayer and say, Holy Spirit, these are the things that I know are are in the way. Help me have a strategy to overcome. Right? Holy Spirit, what lies have I believed about my identity? How have they impacted my relationship with you, with you Lord? <coughs> and he'll show us. How can you ensure that God's kingdom remains the primary focus of not only your work, but your, your personal life? God's kingdom should be primary focus. In what areas of your life are you currently struggling to maintain focus? There's, I'm sure we could name a few. But ask the Holy Spirit, what changes can I make to help me stay in line with God's plans and desires for me, his purposes for me. In what areas of your life do you need a you need greater discernment? We all could use it. And what steps can you tell me? What strategy can you show me to how to grow that? We can look at the discernment challenge. What practices can help strengthen our ability to hear and follow the Holy Spirit's guidance. And how can you seek God's strategy for, the, for any of the specific challenges that you're facing right now, whether it's at a family challenge, a business challenge, you know, even a church challenge, trying to find your way to a, a local assembly that aligns with how you believe. What does taking action while standing firm in spiritual warfare look like in that situation? Because it's coming. We, we, have to, we have to be prepared, right? I have, I'm not going to go over, but I, I have at least four or five of the main takeaways from each of those messages um, summarized kind of like cliff notes <laughs> from each of the takeaways that I didn't go over today um, that I would be glad to hand out. I, I can uh, make copies or I can put a digital copy up on the web for download um, if somebody would want them. Um, but as we, we draw this uh, teaching to a close, let's not merely see these strategies as as a set of instructions or something that I, I have to do now that is, I have so much to do already, um, but it's the very heartbeat of God for this moment. Like Nehemiah, our time for re rebuilding is now, I believe. And the strategies given here are not just for the future, they're for today. There's a divine invitation here. It's not an invitation to busyness or burdens, as it might feel. But it's an, <clears throat> an invitation to partner with God in what he's already doing. You've been given the tools. We have the tools. Now it's time to take our place on the wall. Knowing that each of us is vital to the work of restoration, this is a bigger-than-you type of thing. 
This is about the restoration of God's people, the rebuilding of his kingdom, and the renewal of identity for those who have forgotten who they truly are in Christ. And as we step into this strategy, remember that our strength does not come from our own ability, but the presence of God himself. In our weariness or our weakness, he is our rest. In our confusion, he is our discernment. In our striving, he is our peace. It is God who carries the weight of the work, and it is he who will see it to completion. Our part is to stay focused, to stay faithful, and to keep our hands to the task, even when the opposition is fierce. But here's the promise. As we work, God fights for us. As we build, he strengthens our hands. As we pray, he gives us strategy. And in the end, it's not just the walls that are rebuilt. It's the hearts and the spirits of his people. So stand firm. The enemies might come with lies, distractions, deceptions, but you are going to do a great work. You cannot come down, and you won't. God has called you to rebuild, and he has already given us the strategies to do so. The walls we are building are for our protection and for his glory in the days ahead. Remain faithful, keep the main thing, the main thing, and watch as God transforms what was once broken into something far more glorious than we could ever imagine. This is the strategy. The time is now, and you are part of it. Let's build. Proverbs 24, verse 3 says, Wise people are builders. They build families, businesses, communities, and through intelligence and insight, their enterprises are established and endure. Because of their skilled leadership, the hearts of the people are filled with treasures of wisdom and the pleasures of spiritual wealth. I just want to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts, knowing that you have called us to a great work. We thank you for the strategies you have revealed and for the discernment to say no to distractions and for the strength to stay focused on the task that you've set before us. Lord, we lay down every distraction, fear, temptation, whatever it is that seeks to pull us away from your purpose. Help us to maintain, remain steadfast like Nehemiah with our eyes fixed on you. Give us the wisdom to discern your voice above all others and the courage to continue building, knowing that you are with us every step of the way. As we leave here today, remind us that the work you have begun in us, you will see it through to completion. Strengthen our hands for the tasks ahead that you may see our lives as a reflection of your glory and your love. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources, and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.